kindness and compassion for the one, the one in whom you love and gave yourself for humanity. Increase my love. Help me to love with open arms like you do. How you love us from the homeless to the famous and in between. As she formed us, you made us carefully. Cause in the end, we're all your children. So help me to love. Just a smile, they would feel the Father's love. So let all my life tell of who you are and the wonder of your never ending love. Oh, let You're wonderful and such a good father. Oh, let all my life tell who you are. And the wonder of your never ending love. Oh, let all my life tell of who you are. Let your such a good father well, you are wonderful and such a good father so help me to love with open arms like you do I love it erases all the lines and sees the truth oh they when they Just a smile, they would feel the father's love. This church, Modern Worship, we're so glad that you're here today. Uh, just want to share with you a couple of announcements, well, really one that's important. Next week, a week from this coming Sunday at 5 uh, o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to be having a hymn sing, an old-fashioned hymn sing, and it'll be a wonderful time together. And immediately following that, at like 6 o'clock or thereabouts, uh, we're going to have an ice cream social. 
So if you want to make ice cream for that, you can sign up in the Narthex. There's a sign-up sheet for making ice cream. I think there's going to be a bit of a competition. I'm not judging, I promise, because I don't want to make enemies in the life of the church. But uh, uh, it'll be a good time. It'll be a good time. I hope that you would put that on your calendars and mark that on your calendars. Are there other announcements that need to be made? If not, let's quieten our spirits as we go to the Lord in prayer to invite the Holy Spirit to be present with us. Gracious and loving Lord, we thank you so much for this amazing day that you've given us, and we thank you for the privilege and wonder of being able to come into your presence. Uh, Lord, lead us uh, close to your heart. Uh, We offer ourselves in service of worship, and we thank you for the privilege of being able to boldly enter into your throne room of grace at any moment and in any place and in any time, and we do that right now uh, because of the awesome work that Jesus accomplished at the cross. And today we say thank you for that, and we say thank you for the relationship that we can share with you in prayer. Uh, Always remind us that you're only a breath away, that you're only a moment away, and that you're always present with us. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Let's stand and sing some songs of praise together. With my life laid down, I'm 
have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God So let's sing of His goodness, church goodness of God. Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. Give everything to you. Let's sing that one more time. 
shepherd, Savior, King, I give everything to you. Amen. You may be seated. And if our ushers would bring forth the joys and concerns. So there's just one concern listed, and that is that uh, Bob Page's brother has been diagnosed with cancer, so we need to remember Bob's uh, brother in our prayer. I know he lives in Texas somewhere, but I know there's no distance in prayer, so we can be praying for Bob's brother. Um, are there other joys or concerns that need to be shared? Uh, we need to continue to remember uh, Anne Green in our prayers. She lost her great-grandson uh, in a car accident, and they celebrated his life yesterday. It was a beautiful service, uh, but it's hard, hard, hard. So uh, let's uh, open our hearts and go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, gracious and loving Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us, and we thank you for the privilege of wonder of being able to come boldly into your throne room of grace, not trusting our own righteousness, but trusting in the awesome and amazing work that you accomplished at the cross. Lord, we thank you that uh, we can at any moment in our lives, go to you in prayer. And as we think about and study about prayer today, we remember that Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, and he teaches us and reminds us that prayer is one of the most important things that we do in the midst of our lives, and that we can do it often and in uh, regular ways, and that it will make a difference in the relationship that we share with you. Lord, we thank you and praise you today for your goodness and for your grace and for your mercy. And for, for your awesome ability, uh, we gratefully acknowledge today that you indeed are the great physician, the one who brings healing and wholeness to each of us. And we pray that for those that are sick and need that touch. We know that there's no distance in that prayer, that we can agree our hearts together here, and that your power is being released in the lives of all of those that need that touch in the course of this day. Uh, we pray that you would uh, bring healing and wholeness to all of us in the midst of this journey. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and for your great grace, and we thank you and praise you for what you're wanting to do in our hearts and in our lives together. Help us to pray more fervently, more faithfully, more completely, and help us to be motivated to pray because we know that you love us and that you care for us and that you want your very best for us. And sometimes we don't get the answers in prayer that we want, but we always get an answer from you, which is the best. And today we say thank you for that reality in our lives. And today we say thank you for uh, guiding us and directing us and helping us to accomplish your will and your purpose in our lives and in our families' lives and in our church's life and in the community's life. Lord, help us to reach out and make a difference in the world around us. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your goodness. And we thank you and praise you for the gift of prayer today. As we celebrate that and as we think about that and as we reflect upon that, help us to practice that more fully and more faithfully. Lord, we thank you for this time together, but above all and in all things, we thank you for Jesus who came into this world to teach us the way to you. He even taught us how to pray to you as he taught us to pray these words with meaning from our hearts. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue to sing this morning.
if you grace the other side. And oh, how long have I chased rivers from lowly seas to where they rise against the rush of grace descending from where the source of its supply is in the high You're neither more or less inclined. I would search and stop at nothing. But you're just not that hard to find. Oh, I will praise you on the mountain. I will praise you when the mountain's in my way. You're the summit where my feet are so I praise you in the valleys all the same no less God within the shadows no less faithful when the night leads me astray you're the heaven where my heart is in the highlands in the heartache all the same extend the path from where your feet rest on the sunrise to where you sweep the sinners past and oh how fast would you come running if just to shadow me through the night and trace my steps through all my Walk me out the other side For who could dare ascend that mountain That valleyed hill called Calvary But for the one I call Good Shepherd Who like a lamb was slain for me I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you in the mountains in my way You're the summit where my feet are So I'll praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray you're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands and the heartache all the same Oh, 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 oh. Whatever I walk through Whatever I walk through Wherever I am Your name can move mountains Wherever I stand And if ever I walk the shadows, my song of ascent, whatever I walk through, wherever I am, your name can move mountains wherever I stand, and if ever I walk through the valley of death, I'll sing through the shadows, my song of ascent, my song of in 
my way. You're the summit where my feet are. So I'll praise you in the valleys all the same. No, there's God within the shadows. No, there's faith when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is. In the highlands and the heartache all the same. Amen. You may be seated. We've come to the time in our worship service where we worship God through our giving. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward as we pray over the offering. Oh, gracious and loving Lord, you've given us so much, and today we say thank you by giving a portion back to you so that your kingdom can come in fullness right here in Broken Arrow and the surrounding area, but around the world as well. I thank you in advance for the generous hearts of each giver. Bless them in their generosity, for we know deeply, deeply within our spirits that we would never be able to outgive you. You gave your very best when you gave Jesus at the cross. And today we say thank you from the depths of our being as we give into your kingdom so that it might come and transform lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to share with you a passage of scripture from the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. This is Jesus teaching his disciples about prayer. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you had a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey came to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answered, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and the, my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he was not, would not get up and give him the bread because he was a friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he, said he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if you ask, your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of God for the people of God. And let us pray. Lord, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord our rock and our redeemer. And we'd be quick to give you all of the praise and all of the glory. Amen. 
Some time ago when uh, Leonard Griffith was the pastor of City Temple in London, he wrote a book entitled Barriers to Christian Belief. And in that book, one of those barriers that people often run into was an unanswered prayer in their life. Uh, for some reason or other, a prayer wasn't answered in the way that they thought it would be answered, and as a result of that, they give up on God, and they uh, find that to be a barrier to believing that God is good, and that God loves us, and that God is faithful. And sometimes it's hard in the midst of the journey as we think about that, and we don't understand always how prayer works or how it uh, makes a difference in our lives. And that brings us to the question this morning, so how do you pray? That's what the disciples were asking Jesus. I love the occasion in which they're asking him that. They're not asking him that question after what? They're not asking him that question after a lecture or after a teaching or any of those things. They're asking him that question when? When he had just finished praying. Jesus prayed regularly. In the Gospel of Luke, we find that, that it was a regular part of his daily living, that he prayed, and the disciples saw him, and as a result of seeing him, they were uh, encouraged to ask him, teach us how to pray, just like John, John the Baptist, had taught his disciples how to pray. People that make a difference are people that pray, as we think about that and reflect upon that. Jesus prayed regularly. In the Gospel of Luke, there are so many occasions where it's re we're reminded that Jesus uh, set aside time or went out and quietly slept a, slipped away so that he could spend time in prayer with his Father because he knew it was so important and so vital in developing and maintaining that relationship with his Father. One thing is clear, there's a lot of questions concerning prayer, and there's a lot of misconceptions, I think, also in that process. I love the Peanuts cartoon where Charlie Brown is on his bedside, kneeling and praying, uh, and then uh, he suddenly stops and he talks to Lucy, and he says, Lucy, I think I've made a new theological discovery, a real breakthrough. If you hold your hands upside down, you get the opposite of what you pray for. But, you know, sometimes we think about God in those lights, don't we, in that light. Sometimes we think, well, it's the magic lamp. If you rub it just right, a genie comes out and you get your wish. But that's not prayer at all. That's not what Jesus is teaching us today as we think about that or reflect upon that. Uh, there was a radio preacher in, in North Carolina, and he had a bad habit of asking for money every time he went on to the air. And uh, so that got to be a problem, and the owner of the radio station came to him and said, we're getting calls about you that you're asking for money all of the time. You've got to quit doing that if you want to maintain your program on my radio station. And he said, well, is it all right for me to pray? Well, certainly it'll be all right for you to pray. That's not a problem at all. So at the end of the program, he's praying along, praying along, and uh, for the normal things. And then uh, he says... Lord, you know that I have to uh, I, that I not to that I'm not going to ask for money. But then he goes on to saying, "But my address is P.O. Box nine or two sixty nine, Piney Bluff, North Carolina." You know, sometimes we get the wrong perception of prayer, don't we, in that journey? And sometimes we are all about ourselves, and we miss the reality of what that can be and what it could be to be in relationship with the living God. And I think that it's really amazing that we have that opportunity. You know, today it would be very difficult for us to get an appointment with the President of the United States, wouldn't it? It would be nearly impossible. You might take months or even years to be able to get an appointment, or you may never be able to unless you have some kind of connection in that journey. But you know what? We have the opportunity at any moment, any time of the day, to enter into a conversation with God, who is so much more powerful than the President of the United States and can do so much more for us in the midst of that journey when we think about it. And that leads me to the idea of, of, of what Jesus is trying to convey to his disciples, some things that we might learn from the lesson today. The first of all is that Jesus uh, prayed regularly, and so can we. I think the regularity of our prayer is important, that God wants us to pray uh, continually. The Apostle Paul put it that way, that we can pray without ceasing. 
I literally tried that one time when I was young into faith, just tried to pray all the time, and I was talking continually because I didn't understand what prayer was. That prayer is so much more than just speaking to God, isn't it? But it's always a two-way conversation, and probably the most important part of it isn't speaking at all. It's listening to what God has to say to you because I think that's really at the heart of it. And, you know, when I truly get into the mode of listening to God when I'm praying, Almost every time it comes back something like this, Roland, I just love you so much. Because that's what God continually speaks to us. It's a sacred echo. Everywhere we look, we can see that God loves us, that he cares for us. We can see it in the awesome and amazing realization of his creation and all of the amazing things that he does for us and in us and through us. We can see it all the time, really, if we would just open our hearts to that possibility. Uh, Jesus prayed regularly. Uh, the missionary, Allison, uh, from England once said something that kind of resonates with my heart, really, when we think about it. There is only one test of our prayer life. Do we want God? Do we want him so much that we will go on if it takes five or six or ten years to find him? There is only one thing, one real test. Do we want God. Because that's what prayer is about, isn't it? It's seeking God. I love the song today where we can seek him in the highlands. You know, it's amazing when we think about that and reflect upon that. It's that God is calling us to seek his heart, to look, after, look for him in all that we're about and all that we're doing, that we can pray regularly with everything that is within us. And that's what the disciples were asked to do. You know, if, if you want to become a musician, you have to what? Practice, don't you? That just doesn't come to you. Uh, if you want to become a good athlete, you have to what? Practice. Uh, if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or any other of the professions, you have to what? Work hard, diligently uh, seeking and uh, staying with it, don't you? And the same is true in our prayer lives, that we need to stick with it that God is calling us to not give up, that God is calling us uh, to be persistent. I love the parable in the story today that Jesus shares. If there was somebody coming to you in the middle of the night, you might not answer them because they're, you're, they're, you're their best friend, but you would answer them because of their boldness and their willingness to stick with it uh, and not give up, that you're going to get out of bed even though it's midnight and get some bread for this guy because what? He keeps at it. And I think that should be our attitude in prayer as well, really, when we think about it and reflect upon it and, and uh, begin to practice it. Jesus also prayed sensibly in that life, in that light, and so can we. I'm reminded of a story, tongue-in-cheek a little bit, that was in Sports Illustrated years ago. And the writer of Sports Illustrated was talking about a couple of different baseball players that played in the major leagues. One of them was a batter, and he said, the batter said to him one time that every time I get up to the plate, I ask God that I could hit it as far as I could possibly hit it. And then the other one was a pit pitcher, and the pitcher said to the same writer that, uh, you know, sometimes every time I go out on the mound, I pray that God would help me get him out. So one guy's praying to get a hit, and one guy's praying to get him out. And the sports writer, tongue-in-cheek, said it must be a quandary for God when those two people meet at the plate, because that would be a difficult situation to be in if you're God. Whose prayer do you honor? But sometimes we pray selfish prayers, don't we, really, in the midst of the journey? And it's not about that. God wants us to pray sensibly. God wants us to pray in a way that uh, can make a difference uh, in the world around us. Longfellow said it this way, what discord we should bring into the universe if all of our prayers were answered. Then we should govern the world and not God. Wow, that's powerful when you think about that. If God gave you everything that you ever asked for, you're really making yourself into God, aren't you? Because sometimes God answers prayers in ways that we don't want to hear. My mom used to say it this way. I, I've always thought her to be one of the best theologians and the best minds that I've uh, had the privilege of being around. And she talked about prayer often, and she prayed often. She prayed every day. I don't suppose a day went by where she didn't pray. And sometimes she made big lists. 
I'm looking forward to sometime maybe this summer or later on to go through some of the journals that she has. They're all stored away at my sister's house now. And I could see those lists of people that she prayed for, and then on the other side of that, there would be a check mark, and I'm assuming that that check mark meant that God answered that prayer some way or another. But it's not just about a list, is it? It's about more than that. And I think really when we think about that and realize uh, that we can pray regularly and that God needs us to pray regularly, but my mom used to always say, well, God always answers prayer. She didn't ever talk about unanswered prayer. She said, God answers prayer one of three ways, and she would always say, and I'm sure that she read this somewhere, and I don't know who would be the originator of that uh, thought, but he said, God answers prayers by either saying yes immediately, and sometimes we get those answers. You ever have one of those prayers that was answered, and you just knew it was God, and, and it was immediate, and it was a wonderful thing, and it built your faith, and it was just filled you with joy and wonder and uh, amazement that, that God listened and answered your prayer the way that you wanted it to be answered. But my mom also says, well, sometimes God said, it's not now. It's not the right time. Wait on it. Well, I hated that one because I was always been and continue to be an impatient person. But sometimes we do. We need to wait on God so that God's timing is right as well to answer our prayers. And then she went on and said, sometimes God just says no. And that's an answer, isn't it? It's an answer to prayer. God says no. And sometimes... It's got to be all right for us to accept that and embrace that because God knows best. Do we believe that? Because if God knows best, we want God to be on the throne, don't we? We don't want to be on the throne. We want God to be on the throne. And sometimes God says no uh, when we pray, uh, when it's not right, when it's a selfish prayer, when it's, uh, Lord, let me get a hit. And it's the picture saying, Lord, let me get him out. When it's just about them. And when it's just about us. And God reminds us in that process that we can pray in meaningful ways and always expect an answer. It may not be immediate, but God will answer our prayers. And I think this, I think the third thing that maybe we can think about in the lesson today, and there's so many, there's endless possibilities in the scripture this morning is that Jesus prayed confidently and so can we. Jesus prayed with confidence. Jesus prayed in a ways that uh, changed the world. And one of the ways that Jesus prayed, uh, and I'm thinking of the prayers that are so meaningful in his life and the one that sticks to my mind is when he's in the garden of Gethsemane and he's wanting that cup to be taken from him. He's not wanting to go to the cross and would you no, it seems like a horrific way to die. He's so young and he's so vital and he has so much to give to the world. He uh, has so much understanding of God and he could continue to teach and he doesn't want to die. And he says, nevertheless, Lord, not my will be done, but thine. Thy will be done. And I think when we pray that prayer in our lives, we can pray it with absolute and complete assurance and confidence that God will accomplish what needs to be accomplished in our lives uh, through prayer. Because isn't prayer really about just building the relationship with God? Isn't it about realizing that God is there for you in the midst of the journey and that you can be there for God, that you can seek God? A prayer at its best is a two-way conversation, isn't it? It's uh, you speaking to God, but it's you also listening to God because we need to hear God in order to experience the reality of what God has for us in our lives together. James Moore tells a wonderful story that I want to retell on him. When he was in the fifth grade, James Moore wanted a, a motor scooter. And he went and he asked his dad, thinking his dad would just give him anything because his dad loved him. And he said, Dad, could you get me a motor scooter? And his dad just looked him in the eye and he said, no. And James Moore's heart was kind of crushed. And then he said, it's too dangerous. And James Moore was just thinking, oh, Dad. So he didn't get the motor scooter, but he had a friend, Roy Wilcox, who had one. 
So he went over to Roy Wilcox's house one day, and he was wanting to ride that motor scooter, and finally he talked Roy into let him ride that motorcycle, or motor scooter, and uh, he only forgot one thing. He forgot to ask Roy how to stop it. So here he is, he's out riding around and around and around, and it reminds me of a story that happened to me when I was a, a, a preteen uh, in Michigan. I went over to my friend's and uh, my brother-in-law's house, Bob Fagan, I talk about Bob on occasion, uh, and we did wild things over there, and he let me ride the family's snowmobile. Have you ever ridden a snowmobile? And I wanted to drive it, so I got on the snowmobile. I didn't ask him how to stop it. I thought those little things that were like brake candles would just stop it immediately. And I got out there, and I was going, and uh, I was giving it the gas. You know, you give it more gas by like a motorcycle, sort of. And I've seen that, and I realized that that's what, that'd be great. And then I realized, I don't know how to stop this, and these brakes don't work. This isn't stopping this machine. And finally, Bob Fagan is running. I got it slowed down enough, let off the gas where he could get beside me, jumped on it, and stopped the snowmobile. And I'm thinking, wow, whew, that was scary. Uh, always know how to stop a vehicle before you start it. That's a very, very valuable lesson, I think. James Moore was kind of in the same quandary because he's riding that motor scooter around and around, and on the fifth time around, he's yelling to his friend Roy Wilcox, how do I stop it? But Roy can't hear him, and he's going too fast, and finally he says, the only way I'm going to ever get this stop is I'm going to wreck it. So he laid it down. He laid down the little motor scooter right on the street. It skinned up his knee. It hurt him kind of badly in that process, not seriously, seriously, but it hurt him. And then he began to think about what his dad said. No, they're too dangerous. And he said, my dad was right. I don't think I really do need or want a motor scooter. And you know, sometimes our Heavenly Father knows the best, doesn't he? In the midst of the journey. Our Heavenly Father knows what's good for us and what's not. And sometimes we need to trust him in that journey. Always we need to trust him in that journey. That God, when a door is closing and we pray our hearts out and hope that it doesn't, it might be for our own good. That God is working all things together for good to those who believe. Not all things happen to us are good, but God can work them redemptively for our own good. I'm going to close with a story that Leslie Weatherhead shared. You may have heard this story before. It's a beautiful story about an old Scotsman. He was uh, uh, ill, and his pastor went to visit him. And the pastor went to visit him, and he was in bed. The old man was in bed, and uh, the pastor noticed that there was just an empty chair sitting right next to the bed. And he inquired about that. He asked the old man, why is that chair there? And the old man shared a wonderful story. He said, when I was a younger man, the old man said that uh, I used to find it very difficult to pray. I didn't know what to say or how to do it or how to even approach it. And then he said, my pastor came out one time and shared with me a little secret of his. He said, you know, just get an empty chair and put it right there and uh, just imagine that God's sitting in that chair. And when you pray, you don't have to use fancy words. Just have a conversation with God sitting in that chair right there. He said, you know what? I tried that and it worked for me. It was meaningful and every time I pray, I have an open empty chair that I sit across from and look into and just have a conversation with God. A few weeks later, the old man passed away peacefully in the night. And the daughter called the pastor, uh, who had visited with him earlier, and said, it was really strange. He just passed peacefully in the night, but it was really strange. Uh, you know that chair that sits by his bed? His hand was reached out, resting on that chair. And the pastor said, no, it's not strange at all. Your dad was just reaching out to his best friend. That's what prayer really is. Just reaching out to your best friend, knowing that God loves you in every situation, that you can trust him no matter what, and that he's made a way for you to always be in relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ, at the cross. That's what I believe in the name of the Father and of the Son and of God's precious Holy Spirit. Amen.
and uh, sing today in response.
Well, you all have a wonderful week. Go forth from this place, pray without ceasing, and we'll see you here next time. Moment to moment, minute to minute.